We are heading towards a discussion of Kirchhoff's voltage law and Kirchhoff's current law. These are affectionately known as KVL and KCL. But before we get there, we need to define some more things. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to define a node, a central node, branch, a central branch, and then a loop. All right, so let's begin with the concept of node. A node is a really straightforward concept when it comes to circuits. A node is the point of connection between any two or more elements. So let's draw a circuit that we can use as an example here. Okay, so here we have a simple circuit. It's got three resistor elements, a 5, 2, and a 3 ohm. It's got uh, two sources, it's got a 10 volt voltage source over here and a 2 amp current source over here. <clears throat> now a node is where any two or more elements connect up. So look at this circuit right here and see if you can figure out the number of nodes. There are actually, uh, there's a, let's say there's a node there, that's where these two elements connect together. But then when you get to over here, where is the node? Is there a node there, there, and there? No, there's just all of that right there. All of those represent, the, all of those are connected to one point. You could consider that one electrical point. So you've got one, two, three, four elements connected together at that one point right there. So that's a node. And then down here, all of these elements are connected together. So there are three nodes here. The one here where only two elements are connected, this one where more elements, and this one where more elements are connected together. So all three of those are nodes. Now that brings up what is known as an essential node. An essential node is where three or more elements are connected. So a node is two or more, an essential node is three or more. And in this circuit here, there are three total nodes, but two of those, this one at the top and this one at the bottom, those are essential nodes. Next, let's move on and talk about a branch. Now, a branch is a path through a circuit. A branch is any path that connects nodes. So here, going from this node, let's label these nodes. Let's call that one A, we'll call this one B, and this one C. So if we go from node A to node B through that 5 ohm resistor, that represents a branch. So there's a branch there. If we go from A down to C, there's another branch. From B to C, there's a branch there, branch there, branch there. So there's one, two, three, four, looks like five different branches in this circuit here. So once again, a branch is a path that connects nodes. All right, now we deal with the concept of essential branch. Okay, well, what is an essential branch? Well, an essential branch is a branch that connects essential nodes. So here, you can see there's a branch between these two essential nodes, so that's one through that two amp source. Here's another one through the three ohm. Here's another one through the two ohm. But now you can go from this essential node down to this essential node through this branch here. So that's another essential branch, going all the way from B to C or C to B, whichever way you're going. Okay, so there's one, two, three, four essential branches in this circuit here. Now, the number of essential branches is important because the number of essential branches is really equal to the number of currents. So the number of different currents in our circuit here is equal to the number of essential branches. So I'm going to have a branch this way. That represents one current flowing from between these two nodes, B and C. Here's another one, here's another one, here's another one. And those are different currents. So there are one, two, three, four different currents, four different essential branches. All right. The next thing we need to define is a loop. 
Now the idea of a loop is pretty straightforward. A loop is a closed path in a circuit, but it's important that the path not overlap itself. So if a path starts at one point and goes and comes back to that same point without overlapping itself or without crossing over itself, then that is a loop. So we have a loop here like that. Look, there's another loop here and another loop here, but there's also a loop here. You could have a loop all the way around the outside. Or you could have a loop that just encloses these two loops. And then you could have a loop that goes like this. So in this circuit right here, there are six loops possible. There's one, two, three, four, five, and then this one is six. Okay, so there's six possible loops here. And you can see a loop is a path that starts and ends at the same point. However, it doesn't cross over itself. So let me show you what is not a loop. If I were to come down this way, go down here, back up, and now go back to A. See, I started and ended at the same point, but I crossed over myself here. When I went this way, I am not allowed to go back over that branch right there. So if I do this, that's not a loop. A loop has to start and stop at the same point, but not overlap itself. Okay, that brings us to the next concept, which you might think should be called an essential loop, but it is not called an essential loop. An essential loop is actually called a mesh. Okay, now what is a mesh? A mesh is a loop that does not enclose other loops. So I said there are six loops possible here, but there are only three meshes. Here, this is a mesh, this is a mesh, and this is a mesh, and that's it. If I had this loop here, just enclosing these last two loops here, see they're enclosing other loops, so that's not a mesh. Because I here's a loop here, here's a loop here, and this would enclose those two loops. So a mesh is a loop that does not enclose other loops within it. Now all of these definitions here are kind of important because we are going to use those now that we're going to start talking about KVL and KCL. Okay, let's begin with Kirchhoff's current law, which is affectionately known as KCL. KCL says this, the algebraic sum of all of the currents at any node in a circuit equals zero. Now, let's define what that means. Let's say that we have a node here that represents a node and we have four wires connected up to that node. And let's say we've got a current going in there, maybe a current going out there, a current going out there, and maybe a current going in there. So let's call this I1. This will be current two. This will be current three and this will be current four. Okay. The textbook takes the convention that it calls a positive current, a current that is leaving a node. And it calls a negative current, a current that is entering a node. Now, I'll tell you, you don't have to follow this sign convention. If you reverse these, that's, that's your business. It doesn't really matter. But once you apply a sign convention, you need to stick with it, whatever it is. Let me show you why this sign convention can be simplified though. I1 is entering, that makes it negative, so negative I1. I2 is exiting, so it's leaving, so it's going to be plus I2. I3 is leaving, so it'll be plus I3. I4 is entering, so it's going to be minus I4, and that's equal to zero. That's KCL right there. I just wrote a KCL equation. 
Remember, KCL says the algebraic sum of all of the currents at any node in a circuit equals zero. So this is the sum of all of the currents at that node, and you can see the sum must equal zero. So this is really saying the currents coming in has to equal the currents going out. So if I rearrange this and said, well, I2 plus I3 has to equal I1 plus I4, that's what this says. These over here are the currents leaving. So these are the currents that are exiting or leaving. And these are the currents that are entering. So if you think of this as a really straightforward sum of the currents entering uh, is equal to the sum of the currents exiting, then this becomes really easy. You don't have to stick with this sign convention here because when you rearrange the equations like this, the signs go away. So think of KCL like this. The sum of the currents that are entering a node has to equal the sum of the currents exiting the node. This is what goes in must come out. So the sum of the currents going in is equal to the sum of the currents going out. That's it. That's all KCL is. Now that is just a restatement of the conservation of energy. Currents are charges and charges carry energy. So the sum of the energy going in is equal to the sum of the energy going out. That's really a restatement of the conservation of energy in KCL. Now, if that were not the case, if you had more energy going in than you did coming out, then there's going to be a buildup of energy and things are going to melt. If you have more energy going out than you do coming in, then you have to ask the question, well, where's the extra energy coming from? It's got to be coming from somewhere. Uh, that would be a perpetual motion machine and defy uh, the laws of physics. So... What goes in must come out. That's all this says. The sum of the currents going in is equal to the sum of the currents going out. That's KCL. Now KCL can apply in a more complicated case. Let's say that we got uh, wires going this way and this way and this way, and maybe we got a wire going here, another one coming off here, 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 something like that. Okay, and let's say we've got currents going in there, out there, in there, maybe one across this way, another one that way, another one this way, current that way, current this way, current that way, current that way. Between these, we've got currents going like that, maybe like that. You see there's currents going everywhere around here. Now, there could be elements between each of those nodes. There's a node, there's a node, nodes all around this. Nodes are spread all around. But KCL says this, you can treat a big chunk of this as if it is a node. For example, let's draw a dashed line here just around these nodes, like that. Now, if I look at that bean-shaped dashed line there, and treat that like it is a node, then KCL still applies. This is a closed boundary, and uh, KCL applies to closed boundaries as well as to uh, individual nodes. Now it encloses a bunch of nodes, but if you were to do this, if you were to take this current, and this current, and this current, and looks like this one's going into the bean, and this one's coming out of the bean, and this one's going in. If you were to take everything that's going into and out of that dashed line right there, that dashed curve, that dashed closed surface there, then you would discover that KCL still applies. The sum of the currents going in is equal to the sum of the currents coming out. After all, if you think about it, a node can be considered a closed boundary like this that's reduced down to a point like that right there. So this is a closed boundary that represents a node, and if you sum up the currents going into and out of that node, then KCL still applies. The sum of the currents going in is equal to the sum of the currents going out. Now it's also this that allows us to combine current sources. So if I have, let's say, a current source here, another current source here, 
another current source here. And let's say this one is I1, this one is I2, this one is I3. And now let's connect all of these together. So that I've got my two terminals here, terminal A and terminal B. Well, if I look at the currents, let's see, I3 is coming up this way and going that way. And at that node, I2 is going down this direction. And if I imagine another current going this way and another current going this way and joining up with those, then if you add up all of these currents right here, the current that ultimately ends up going in that direction for A uh, into terminal A, along terminal A, I should say, then you will discover that those currents add up simply so that they could become one current source here, terminal A and terminal B. Now, what would the current of this source be? Well, if I want to say up is positive, then it would be I1 minus I2 plus I3. Whatever I1, I2, and I3 are, this circuit here is equivalent to these right here. That's nothing but KCL being applied here. All of these are going to add together in such a way that it's equivalent to this, and that current right there going into terminal A is still the same I that we had over here, okay? So there's KCL uh, presented to you. Now, let's move on and talk about KVL. Kirchhoff's voltage law, or KVL, is equally simple, except it applies to voltages and not to currents. It works like this. It says the algebraic sum of all of the voltages around a loop equals zero. All right, so in order for us to understand this, let's look at a loop. Once again, I'm going to draw this same circuit right here that we talked about previously. Okay, here's our circuit, and now let's look at the loops here. Now we said there's six loops possible in this, so KVL would apply to all six of these loops. KVL applies to loops, but KVL also applies to meshes because meshes are a certain type of loop. So KVL applies to all loops. Let's look at this first loop here, which is also the first mesh right here. Now, there's going to be some voltage drop. Let's call that V5 for the 5, volt, uh, for the five ohm resistor here, plus minus like that. And there's going to be some voltage. Let's call it V2 for across the 2 ohm, plus minus like that. Well, the voltage across this, plus the voltage across that, plus the voltage across the source here, if I go around the loop, Let's say I start here at this point right there and I go clockwise around the loop and I sum up all of those voltage rises and voltage drops, then it should equal zero. That's what KVL says. The algebraic sum of all of the voltage rises and drops around a loop has to equal zero. All right, well, let's say that we know these voltages for the sake of this discussion. We know what V5 is. Then if I start here in the upper left-hand corner and I go clockwise, then you'll notice I'm on the high side of the potential here, and I'm going to the low side of the potential here. So as I traverse through the five ohm resistor, I'm going from the high side to the low side. That represents a voltage drop. I'm going through a voltage drop as I traverse through the five ohm. Now the textbook takes the sign convention once again that a positive sign is a voltage drop and a negative sign is a voltage rise. But this says a voltage drop is positive, so V5 would be positive. And then as I go around through the two ohm here, that's going from the high side to the low side again, then V2 would also be positive because it's a drop. I'm traversing the loop, starting in the upper left-hand corner, and I'm going clockwise around the loop. Now the next thing I encounter is this 10 volt source. Now when I cross through the 10 volt source, trying to get back where I started from, so it's a complete loop, 
I start on the low side. You see the negative sign there? That represents the low potential side of the source. And the positive represents the high potential side of the source. So I'm going from low to high as I pass through the source. That represents then a rise. So minus the voltage of the source, which would be 10 volts, has to equal zero. That's a KVL equation right there. The voltage drop plus the voltage drop plus the voltage rise, then I'm back to where I started from, has to equal zero. So the algebraic sum of all of the voltage drops and rises has to be zero. Now, like I say, you don't have to follow this sign convention, but if you do follow a sign convention, you need to be consistent and stick with it all the way through the problem. To be honest, there's nothing wrong with this sign convention, but it's kind of counterintuitive to what most people think. When you think of a rise, you think of something going up, and it's probably been drilled into your head in physics that if something goes up, it's positive. If something goes down, it's negative. So a rise is positive and a drop is negative. Now that's probably just normal thinking, I think, for most people. So if this sign convention were reversed, to be honest, it would make more sense to me, and it might make more sense to you. That's one way to do it. Uh, but notice also what's happening here. The same way that we talked about voltage uh, currents going into and out, you could do the same thing here. What is these two right here? Well, those two right there, those would be voltage drops. So this would be voltage drops. And if I take this and put it on the other side of the equal sign, this becomes positive, and these what were, were what? Rises? These are voltage rises. So the sum of the voltage drops is equal to the sum of the voltage rises. Now, if you write it like this, the sum of the drops is equal to the sum of the rises, Notice you don't have to decide which one's positive and which one's negative. However, just keep your sign convention straight, whatever you do. So this is just another restatement of KVL. The same uh, sign convention that the textbook uses, you're welcome to use, or even reverse this. But whatever you do, be consistent. Stick with it, be consistent. Now, we've talked about KVL and we've talked about KCL. What we need to do is we need to be able to put these together so that they, uh, we can use them then to solve uh, problems. All right, here we have a circuit. Now, before we go on, let's talk about the number of nodes, essential nodes, branches, and so forth in this circuit. Let's begin. How many nodes are in this circuit? Pause the video right now and see if you can figure it out. All right, here we go. There's a node there. Here's a node here. All of that's a node. Uh, there's another node there. Here's a node here. All of that. Here's another node here where these two things are connected. Now, I put it the dot there on the corner, but it could be anywhere along here. Here's another node here. Here's a node here. These three elements join together. Here's another node here. Those three elements join together. And then here's another node here. So it looks like we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine nodes. And I think that's it. I think I got them all there. Okay, but how many of those are essential nodes? All right, pause the video again. See if you can figure out which ones are the essential nodes. This is not an essential node. There's only two elements connected there. This is an essential node. That's not an essential node. This is an essential node. That's not an essential node. That's not an essential node. That's an essential node. That's an essential node. And that's not an essential node, this last one here. So how many essential nodes are there? One, two, three, four. There's only four essential nodes here. Okay, then how many branches are there? Remember a branch is just something that connects nodes. So there's a branch here, there's a branch here, there's a branch here, there's a branch there, there's a branch here, 
a branch there. There's another one going up this way. There's a branch here. There's another one going up this way. There's a branch here and there's a branch here. Now I didn't count those, but you can see the number of branches there. There's, there's several of them. Okay, but how many essential branches are there? Well, the essential branches are going to be the branches that connect essential nodes. Now that's important because that represents the number of currents that are present. So if we label these, let's label that one A, B, C, and D, then there is an essential branch that goes from A all the way around to C. So all of this right here represents an essential branch through the 4 ohm, through the 3 volt, through the 3 ohm. That's an essential branch because we're going from branch A to C there. So that means there's going to be a current that goes in that direction right there. That's the same current that goes up through the 3 volt and the same current that goes through the 3 ohm. We'll just call that I1 there. Okay, so there's one. Here's another essential branch going down this way through the 5 ohm. So there will be a current there. We'll call that I2. There's another essential branch going from here, A to B, the same way there's an essential branch going from C to D. So let's give those currents, let's call this one I3, and this one up here, I4. And then going from, let's say, B straight down to D through the 7 ohm, that's I5. And then going from B around to D around this outer essential branch here, let's call that I6. Okay, so how many essential branches are there? One, two, three, four, five, six. So we have six essential branches. All right, so what we've done here is we have figured out the number of essential branches and therefore figured out the number of currents. Now we have assigned current directions here. You notice I put uh, arrows on these. I don't know for sure that that's the direction that the current goes, but you know what? It's okay to not know that. If I solve this problem and figure out that the current is negative, that just means I guess the wrong direction for my arrow. That does not mean, though, that I must go back and change that arrow direction. Don't do that. Just get used to the fact that some currents will be negative. Some currents will be positive. Some currents will be negative. Just learn to work with positive and negative currents. But what we've done here is really the first step in solving any KVL or KCL problem. If the currents aren't assigned and current directions aren't assigned, you need to assign those current directions. And we've assigned them and given them variable names I1 through I6, and that would be what we solve for. So a KVL, KCL problem consists of solving for the currents. All right, so that's the first step, assign the current directions. In sub E, let's let that represent the number of essential nodes. So in sub E, number of essential nodes. If N sub E represents the number of essential nodes, then N sub E minus 1, that's the number of independent KCL equations you can write. So the number of independent KCL equations that can be written is N sub E minus 1. So what is N sub E? The number of essential nodes. I have four essential nodes here. So that means I can write 4 minus 1, or I can write 3, KCL equations. Okay, there's the second step. I need to write n minus 1 KCL equations. So I need to write three KCL equations. Now I can write a KCL equation for node A. I can write a KCL equation for B, C, and D. Uh, that would give me four KCL equations, but I don't need four. I, I can only write three of those that are independent. So if I were to write an equation for A and B and C and D, you would discover that one of those is not independent. In other words, let's say I had A, B, and C. You could derive equation D just from A, B, and C. D would not be independent. It would be 
dependence uh, on these other three there. All right, so let's write three KCL equations. All right, for node A, let's write a KCL equation for node A. Well, how many currents are going in and how many currents are going out? Looks like I1 is going in, I2 is going out, and I4 is also going out. So what does that mean? I1 is going in, that's the only one that's going in, and that's equal to those that are going out, and what's going out? I2 and I4. There, we've just written our first KCL equation for this circuit. Now let's do another one for node B. Look at node B, how many currents are going in, how many currents are going out? Looks like I4 is going in, I5 is going out, I6 is also going out. So I4 is going in, I5 is going out, and I6 is also going out. All right, let's write KCL equation for node C then. Looks like two is going in, one and three are going out. So I2 is equal to I1 plus I3. Okay, now uh, notice here for D, we could write an equation for D. Let's go over here and write an equation for D. This is not going to be an independent equation though. But I want to show you that this is possible to do. Look at the currents going in. I3 is going in, I5 is going in, I6 is also going in. So all three currents are going in. There are no currents going out. So I3 plus I5 plus I6 equals zero. It is not a requirement that you have currents going both in and out. You could have just like this, you can have currents going in. Or you could just have currents going out. It doesn't matter. That's still a KCL equation. And if I left out one of these others, I could use that one if I wanted to. But I don't want to. Let's get rid of that one. We don't need it. We have our three independent KCL equations. And that's all that we can write. N sub E minus one. In other words, three KCL equations. Okay. So there's the next step. We've written down our KCL equations. The next step then is to write down enough loop equations that we can solve this, this problem. Okay, now what are we solving for? Remember what we're solving for. We're solving for the currents. The I1s, I2s, and so forth, all the way through I6, those are the unknowns. Those are the things that we need to figure out. So there's how many unknowns? Six. There are six unknowns here. How many uh, independent equations do we have? We have three. So how many more do we need? We need three more. If we have six unknowns, we need six equations. So far we only have three, so we need three more equations. Now, you need to write these equations so that they include every element in at least one of the equations. The easiest way to do that, to be honest, is to write loop equations, but write them for the meshes. Just write them for the meshes. I'll show you how to do that here. Now, here's my general rule of thumb. And uh, those of you that have had me for previous classes know that I like you to do this. So do this and, and you, you, won't, you won't go wrong. How's that? I have one, two, three meshes here. Anytime I write down a loop equation, I start in the same place of a mesh. I start in the upper left-hand corner, and when I traverse it, I go clockwise. So upper left-hand corner, clockwise. Upper left-hand corner, clockwise. Upper left-hand corner, clockwise. If you stick to that, uh, you will not go wrong. It's a system that you can then hang on to. But you as a good student, you understand that you don't have to do that. You could go other, other ways and other directions. The uh, KVL equations will work. Okay, so we've got our three KCL equations. We need our three KVL equations. Here's the way I'm going to do that. I'm going to call this the left loop, LL. This is the center loop, CL. And this is the right loop, RL. For each of those loops, I'm going to start in the upper left-hand corner, go clockwise, and figure out what the KCL equation is. 
So here I'm going to write it right down here, L, L. I'm going to write an equation for the left loop. Again, there are a number of ways to do this. You can follow the sign convention of the textbook. You can make up your own sign convention. You can make it so positive is up and, and negative is drop and so forth. And that's the way I'm going to do it. I am going to call negatives a voltage drop. And I'm going to call positive a voltage rise. Now, that's just because that's what makes sense in my head. Drop drop something, it goes down, so it's negative. Uh, something goes up, it rises, it's positive. But look here, starting the upper left-hand corner of the left loop, the first thing I encounter is this 3-ohm resistor. When I traverse through the 3-ohm resistor, if I'm going in that direction, notice I am going in the direction that the current would go. The current goes from left to right through this 3-ohm because that's I1, so there's only one current here. So that same current is going to go from left to right through the 3 ohm. Now a current naturally goes from high potential to low potential. That's the direction in which a charge would naturally flow, from a high potential point to a low potential point. Just like a ball on a hill, which is at a high potential point, is naturally going to roll down the hill to the low potential point. That's what's happening here. So this is the high potential side, that's the low potential side. Why? Uh, how do I know that? Because of the direction of the current. I've established that this is the current direction that I care about, and therefore this is the high side and that's the low side. So when I go through the 3 ohm resistor, I'm going from the high side to the low side, I'm passing through a drop. A drop is negative, so the voltage across that 3 ohm, well, what is the voltage across that 3 ohm? It's going to be negative. Negative what, though? What is that voltage? Well, Ohm's law. V equals IR. I is I1. That's the voltage through the 3 ohm. What is R? 3 ohms. So minus I1 times 3 that is the voltage drop across the 3 ohm resistor. All right, now we're sticking to the meshes, so we've just passed through our first element here. We're going to turn the corner now and go down through the 5 ohm resistor. Notice I'm going in the direction of the current. If I'm going in the direction of the current, then that is a drop. This would be the high side and that would be the low side. So going down that way, minus I2 times 5. That's 5 ohms. That's the voltage drop across the 5 ohm. Now let's go through the, we're turning the corner again, going through the 4 ohm here, and it's we're back to I1 now. So it's still a drop. Now how do I know that? Because I'm going in the direction of the current. Minus I1 times 4 ohm. And that brings us to this corner now. And now I'm going to go up to back to the point where I started, but I have to pass through this 3-volt source. When I pass through the 3-volt source, notice I'm going from the low side to the high side. That's a rise, so that will be positive. Plus, well, what's the voltage? 3 volts. Okay, now I'm back to where I started from. So we've got the drop across the 3, the drop across the 5, the drop across the 4, the rise across the 3 volt source, that has to equal zero. There, I have just written my first KVL equation for the left loop. Okay, now we need another equation for the center loop, another equation for the right loop, then I'll have my total of six equations, six unknowns. Let's do one for the center loop then. Okay, I'm going to follow the same uh, general pattern Start in the upper left-hand corner and glow clockwise. So first thing I encounter is I'm passing through this 4-volt source here. I'm going from the high to the low, so that represents a drop through the 4-volt source. Minus 4. I continue on in the direction of the current. Now, you'll notice, as far as the sources are concerned, the current direction doesn't matter. 
You look at the source when it comes to determining if it's a rise or a drop. You do not look at the current. You only look at the current when it's passing through a resistor to determine if it's a rise or a drop. So this was a drop through the source because that's what the plus minus here is telling us. When we come to the six ohm though, we're also, it's also going to be a drop because we're going in the direction of the current. So minus I four times six. And that brings us to this corner. We're turning the corner now going down this way. And when we do this, we're also going in the direction of the current. So it's going to be minus I five times seven turn the corner again and now for the first time we're going against the current. If we're going against the current then that's a rise plus I3 times the 8 ohm. Now I've left off this, the units here but that's okay. You get the idea. Okay that brings us to this point. Now we need to turn the corner and go back up here to where we started and you can see we're going against the current. So if we're going against the current, that's going to be a rise. So plus I2 times 5. And that brings us back to where we started, equals 0. Okay, now we have our second KVL equation, and it's for the center loop here. We need one more, and then we'll have our six equations, six unknowns. Right loop, R sub L. The right loop, we're going to start in the upper left-hand corner, and we're going to go clockwise. Stick to that pattern, you'll, and you'll never fail. Okay, when we go through the 9, we are going in the direction of the current. So that's a drop minus I6 times 9. Now we're going to turn the corner and go through the 10-volt source. And when we do that, we're going from the high side to the low side. That represents a drop, so minus 10 volts. Now we're going through the 1 ohm. Again, we're going in the direction of the current all around here. So we're going through the 1 ohm, so it'll be minus I6 times 1. Okay, now we turn the corner. We're trying to get back up to where we started. We're going to go against the current here, so that's going to be plus I5 times 7. And then we're back to where we started is equal to zero. I1, I2, I3, I4, I5, and I6. They appear in these equations. Uh, these are all independent equations and we should be able to solve this. That is six equations with six unknowns. Now, I encourage you to learn how to use your calculator so that you can solve a six by six matrix or a system of equations that is uh, six, equation, uh, six equations with six unknowns. I encourage you to learn how to do that on your calculator. Okay, you will need to do that come exam time. Be able to do that. But I want you to also be able to write a six by six matrix for this. Let me show you what I mean by this. What I want you to be able to do and I want you to present the data to me like this, is I want you to make a column for all of the I1 coefficients, and then another column for all of the I2 coefficients, another column for all the I3s, and the I4s, and the I5s, and the I6s, okay? You're gonna write these coefficients in these columns, and then that's going to equal the coefficients that are over here, which are the constants. So you're going to have a, a constant column here, and these constants are just the voltages, you'll see. All right? What this is going to end up being, then, is a matrix that is a 6 by 6 matrix that these are the coefficients. The co we're, we'll fill this in in just a minute, but these are the coefficients. Multiplied by the variables and it is equal to the constants. So what I'm drawing here are the matrix brackets here. This is I1, this is I2, this is I3, this is I4, I5, and I6. 
this was just put up there so that you could keep track. So this is not anything other than just a way to organize things. All right, let me show you now what I mean. This is the I1 column. So we want to write an equation here for A. That's this A node. We want to write an equation for that. And then we want to write underneath that another equation for B, another equation for C, the left loop, center loop, and right loop. So let's write those down. C, uh, left loop, center loop, right loop. Okay. Now A says I1 is equal to I2 plus I4. All right. Well, I1, how many coefficients do I have for I1 then? One. And put this over here. How many coefficients for I2? Well, it's on the right hand side of the equal sign. When I bring it over to the left hand side, it'll be negative 1. And then I3, there's no I3, so that'll be 0. There's an I4. When I bring it over to the other side, it's going to be negative 1. Uh, how many I5s? Well, none. How many I6s? None. So 0 and 0. There. I have just written the coefficients then for the first KCL equation at node A. I've taken this, moved the 2 and the 4 to the other side, and of the equal sign, set it equal to 0. And what is it equal to? 0. There. Okay, now let's do one for the B. Uh, let's see. I1, I2, I3, there are no I1s, 2s, or 3s. So for B, 0, 0, 0. The I1 is 0, the I2 is 0, the I3 is 0. What about the I4? Well, the I4, if I'm going to keep things on the left side of the equal sign, is going to be positive, and it's going to be positive 1. I5, I bring it over to the other side of the equal sign, it's going to be negative, so is the I6. So negative 1 negative 1. When I do that, what's left on the right-hand side of the equal sign is going to be 0. So it equals 0. Okay, let's do the same thing for C here. Now, for C, I1 needs to come over here is going to be negative. So negative 1. I2 is already over on the left-hand side, so that'll be positive 1. I3, when I bring it over, is going to be negative 1. There are no uh, 4, 5s, or 6s here, so that's going to be 0, 0, 0. And on the right-hand side of the equal sign is going to be 0. Now, if I had done this carefully, this line would line up with the I1, this line would line up with the I2, and this line would line up with the I3. And I got a little off there, but it should line up. Now we were left with I4, 5, and 6, but you got to remember these are the I columns here. Left loop. Look at the left loop, I1. I need to write negative 3. Negative 3 for the left loop. For I1, negative 3. What about 2? Look like it's going to be negative 5. What about I3? There's not. Oh, wait a minute. I made a mistake. There's no I3. There's no I4, 5, or 6. Those would be 0. Let's, let's do that. 3, 0, 0, 0. That should line up with the I4. But you'll notice here I didn't combine the 4 and the 3 here. So that's going to be 4, 5, 6, 7, negative 7. So this negative 3 here is actually negative 7 for the left loop. Okay, center loop then. Looks like there's no I1s. There is 5 plus 5 I2. So 0 plus 5. I3s, there's plus 8. I4, there's minus 6. I5 minus 7, and there's no I6s, so 
so there's zero of those. But there's this 4 here. This 4, when I move it to the other side of the equal sign, is going to be positive 4. So that's what goes here, 4. Well, let's see, for left loop, this one was 0. Okay. So that's 0 from the left loop. The center loop turns out to be 4 because the voltage source that was on the left-hand side just moved, moves over here. Ah, I made a mistake again. This 3 volt is going to be moved over here, and this becomes minus 3. Okay? So this 0 here is not 0. It's negative 3. This is plus 4. Let's see if we can get the right loop equation done correctly now. All right. There's no 1s, 2s, 3s, or 4s. There is a I5 here, and it is going to be plus 7. So there's no 1s, 2s threes are fours. There is a five and it is going to be seven. I six is going to be, whoops, there's another I six here. So that's going to be negative 10. And when I take this 10 and move it to the other side, it's going to be positive 10 there. I think I did that one correctly now. Hopefully I didn't make any mistakes along the way. I'll double check things real fast. All right, so it looks correct as long as I transfer the, these equations. So these equations look correct here, these six equations. As long as I transferred things over to the matrix here properly, then it, it looks right. Okay, so now we've got a six by six matrix. Just like that, you don't need that anymore. You don't need this anymore. Those are just there for references so that you can keep your columns and rows straight. What you have here is this coefficient matrix multiplied by the variable matrix is equal to this constant matrix. Okay, if you have a calculator that can solve matrices, which I bet you you do if you've got any kind of TI whatever, then you could plug these coefficients in, these constants in, and it would solve for you. Uh, another way to do it is to do it online. Go find uh, an equation solver online and it will do it for you as well. Or if you have a system of equation solver, you can, I have actually seen people be able to type in the equations exactly the way they look here. And then it solves it as well. So there are equation solvers that are able to do that. Now, when you do this, you can't do this by hand. This is something that you need a calculator or computer to do. However, you're going to get answers, and the answers are there. That's what the answers are. Write those down and see if you can duplicate those answers. Okay, now that you have all of the currents, though, remember our circuit was this right here. This is our circuit. So now that you have that, could you find the voltage across the 6 ohm then? And the answer is yes, you could. Well, the voltage across the 6 ohm is actually this right here. That's it right there. It's a drop, and it's going to be minus 6 I4. Okay? That's it right there. All right, so whatever I4 is, multiply it by 6, and there's your voltage across the 6 ohm. Could you figure out what the power of the uh, 1 ohm is? Yeah, uh, the power of the 1 ohm, power for the 1 ohm is going to be I6 squared times R, which is just 1 ohm. So whatever I6 is, square it, multiply by 1, and that's the power of that 1 ohm right there. Okay, is it, is, it a, a, uh, is it going to be a power supplied or is it going to be power absorbed? Well, remember, this is a resistor and resistors always have positive power. So it's going to be positive here. So yeah, that's it. It's going to be positive because the, the resistor is dissipating away energy. The, the resistor is a passive element. So it's always going to have a positive power then. Okay, if you can keep that sort of thing straight, then, then you'll be okay. And the key here then is to figure out what the currents are. Once you've got the currents, then you can solve pretty much 
anything beyond that. All right, we should be able to then use KVL and KCL uh, to figure out simple circuits as well, other simple circuits as well. Let's say we've got a circuit that looks like this. Okay, well, this is a really simple circuit, and what we want to do is we want to find out what I naught is, and we want to find out what V naught is. And we have all the information that we need right here to solve for this. What you can do is you can apply KCL uh, and KVL. Let's say that we pick this top node right here and we apply KCL to that node. All right, well look here where the uh, currents are going. The current directions are already assigned. So we've got a current going up through this dependent source. You notice the dependent source is 0.5 times I naught. Here's I naught is. So whatever I naught is, that's going to be half of it. But I naught, that, that uh, 0.5 I naught is going into that node. And this 3 amp uh, from the dependent, uh, I'm sorry, the independent source here is also going into that node. I naught is leaving that node. So if we write a KCL equation, these two currents are going in and that one's going out. So let's see, what could we write? We could write um, 0 0.5 I naught, that's going in, plus 3 amps, that's also going in, has to equal I naught. Okay, that's a KCL equation right there. But you'll notice here there's only one variable here. This I naught is the only variable, so we can directly solve for I naught then. So let's see, I naught minus a half is going to be one half I naught is equal to three. So we've got three multiplied by two, that's going to be six amps is what I naught is. So we're able to solve for I naught just using the KCL principle here at the top. Okay, now once we've got I naught then, you can solve for everything else. Let's say we want V naught, which we do here. Then V naught has I naught going in. You notice the polarities have been assigned here for us, and that's important. If that's done, then we can apply the passive sign convention. So what do we need? V naught is equal to I naught times 4 ohms. But ask yourself, anytime you write an equation like this, do I write V equals IR or V equals minus IR? And in this case, I naught is entering the positive terminal, so it would be just the way it is right there. Positive I naught times 4. All right, well, I naught, we figured that out. That was 6 amps times 4 ohms. That's 24 volts. So there we've got our two answers. There's I naught, and here is V naught right there. And we use the concepts of KVL and KCL to figure this out fairly quickly then. And you should be able to apply KVL and KCL in all cases. All right, let's do another one. Okay, for, so for this circuit here, we want to find I naught, V naught, and I delta. You'll see we've got an independent source here, we've got a dependent source here, and this uh, dependent source depends upon I delta. I delta is the current here through the 5 ohm resistor here. And V naught is the voltage across the 20 ohm, and the 20 ohm has I naught going uh, into it like that. Well, let's, uh, let's, let's see. How many nodes do we have here? Look at, look at it and tell me how many nodes right away. There should be, let's see, here's a node, this is a node, and this is a node. So we, just by inspection, we have three nodes. How many of those are essential nodes? Only two. These two over here are essential nodes. Okay, how many branches? One, two, three, four branches. How many essential branches? One, two, three. Three, okay? Three essential branches. How many currents are there then? There should also be three because the number of currents should match the number of essential branches. 
Okay, how many loops are possible here then? There's one here. There's another one here. There's also the outside. So there are three possible loops here. How many meshes are there? This one, one. This one, two. So there's two meshes here. Okay, now that you've got all of that down, let's see if we can uh, solve this. Well, the reference voltages are not assigned for these things. So you've got the current direction assigned though. So what does that mean? That means the current naturally flows from the high to the low side. You could go back and say that's the high side and that's the low side. All right, uh, that way we would know whether or not to write plus or minus, uh, KVL, KCL. What about this one here though? Look, we don't have the voltage uh, plus minus across this one. However, you can figure it out. You got enough information to figure it out. Look, this is a V naught and the polarity has been dis, uh, assigned here. So this element is in parallel with this element. Things in parallel have the same voltage. So the polarity must look just like that. And that V naught is the same as that V naught. It has to be because they are in parallel. Okay. Well, we just figured those things out just by looking at it there. Well, let's apply uh, KCL and uh, see if we can figure out some things. Um, let's pick this top node here because why not? Uh, and apply KCL to it. Let's see, we've got this current going in, we've got this current going in, that current going out. So we could write I naught is equal to I delta plus five I delta, which is six I delta. Okay, we've got an equation here that says I naught is equal to six I delta. So if I get I naught, I can get I delta, or vice versa, if I get I delta, I can get I naught. Either one of those will work. Okay, but that's not enough information. We need more information. Uh, KCL, in this case, isn't going to help us beyond that right there. Well, uh, we could write N minus one, or remember N sub E is the number of essential nodes, which would be two here. We can write N sub E minus one independent KCL equations, which is this right here. So that's our, that's the only thing that KCL is going to supply us is this one equation right here. The rest of it needs to come from KVL. Okay, well, let's see what we can figure out from KVL then. You know, you don't immediately need to be able to see the answer. You can just apply these principles and possibly get to the answer. Okay, so let's apply KVL to the left loop here. And I'm going to do what I always do. I'm going to start in the upper left-hand corner and go clockwise here. Uh, the first thing I encounter then is this drop here. Now, do I want to follow the sign convention uh, of positives being drop and negatives being rise? I think I'm going to this time just to show you that it's possible. So let's call a positive a drop, a negative a rise. This is the sign convention that's used in the textbook. So this is going to be a drop. A drop is positive, so it's going to be 5, oops, 5i five delta. That's the drop across the 5 ohm. Now I'm going to go down through the 20 ohm. And when I do that, that's another drop. So that's going to be plus 20 I naught. So that's the voltage across this. And this, this voltage here, that is what V naught is. Okay, so we've got this voltage plus that voltage. Okay, now I go all the way around here and I'm going, that's a rise then through the 500, so I've got to get that the opposite sign. That's a negative 500, and that's equal to zero. Okay, so we can put the negative on the opposite side and solve the equation maybe. Let's see, 500 is equal to 5i delta plus 20i naught. Ah, now I look and I see we've got two equations, two unknowns. This one has I naught and I delta in it. This one has I naught and I delta in it. We should be able uh, to solve that, okay? So this was found by KVL, this was found by KCL, and we can do that. But before we go on, let's just pause for a minute and see, could I have done something with the right loop instead of the left loop? 
Now, let's, let's see. Let's start here in the upper left-hand corner. If I go this way, I know that it's V0. I know there's a voltage drop of V0 there. And then when I come back over here, that's all I can say, by the way, because uh, it has to have V0 across it because it's in parallel. But that's it. I could then say, okay, drop a V naught, and then when I come over here, going back up, there's a rise of V naught. So what would that tell me? That would tell me that V naught equals V naught. That's not very useful information. But it could also tell me V naught equals I naught times 20, which is what I already know. So there's not a lot of useful information that comes out of this right loop. But you know, maybe you could write it differently. Say V0 equals I0 times 20. We remember which is what I already got over here. So, But thankfully we don't have to do that because we got two equations, two unknowns here. We should be able to do this. So with these two equations then, let's see if we can get to a solution. All right, I naught is 6I delta, so this is going to be 5I delta plus 20 times I naught, which is 6I delta. So this is going to be 5I delta plus 20 times 6 is 125, 125I delta, and that's all equal to 500. So what is that, 130? Oh, this is wrong. That's 120. There you go. Now, when I combine those together, it's 125 I delta. That's equal to 500. So I delta is going to be 500 divided by 125. That's 1, 2, 3, 4. Four amps. Okay, so I delta is four amps. We can then take I at this and plug it in up here. I naught is going to be six times four amps, and that's going to be 24 amps. So we've got I naught, we've got I delta. We're not, so we've done that one, we've done that one. We're not done with V naught yet. Let's do that right here in this little space. V naught is going to be 20 I naught. So that's going to be 20 times 24 amps, 480 volts. So we've got our V naught there. Boom. One, two, three. We've got our three things that we were asked to figure out. Okay, and with that, we are, we've done enough with KVL and KCL. KVL and KCL will be used throughout the entire semester, uh, and it will pop up. But it turns out that KVL and KCL are, is the most difficult way to solve a, a problem in circuits. So a significant number of things that we do from here on out are going to be tricks that help you figure out how to avoid KVL and KCL and simplify matters. And we'll talk about that uh, probably more next time. We do it.